Hello everyone, it's Susan Ingalls, Senior Staff Attorney with South Carolina Legal Services, and we welcome you to another episode of Level Up Law. Every Tuesday at noon, South Carolina Legal Services is leveling up your legal knowledge on the different areas of law that we practice in, and we thank you for tuning in. Today, we're joined by South Carolina Legal Services Attorney Sheila Thomas. Sheila is the Managing Attorney of our Orangeburg Area Office. You know, we have nine offices around the state of South Carolina, and each one covers a multi-county area, and each one has a managing attorney. As you can imagine, it's a very busy job, so we really do appreciate Sheila coming in today and providing this great information about the Real ID. Uh, she'll be talking about the things you need to know and how you can get prepared for getting that Real ID. I want to just quickly note that the webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be posted on our YouTube channel for South Carolina Legal Services later this week. I want you to please keep in mind that this is general information for the public and not legal advice. You should always consult with an attorney for any specific legal issues that you have. Uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, we will provide information on how to apply for free legal assistance at South Carolina Legal Services. Um, Again, you'll be in listen only mode, but do be sure to put questions in the question box. We definitely invite you to do that. Uh, Sheila won't be able to answer specific questions about your particular situation, but she can give general information that you may find helpful in uh, getting an answer to your question. Again, thanks everyone so much for joining us and I will now turn things over to Sheila Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you've attended any of our previous Level Up um, uh, webinars, you know how much information they can provide to you um, that's very useful. Um, and as Susan said, this um, presentation will be recorded. Um, the subject is, what is the real ID and how do I get one? Um, most people may think it's fairly straightforward, but there is a select group of people who are very likely to encounter some obstacles. And about halfway through the presentation, I'll tell you who those people are and give you some idea uh, of how to how to uh, get around those obstacles. I'll tell you a little bit about what the real ID is, um, why we have it, and whether you need it, because everyone does not need it. Sheila, let's go ahead and start advancing your slides. All right, I'm going to get I'm going to skip the first couple. Here we go. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna tell you what the real ID is and why you need it, uh, or why you may not need it, uh, explain how to get one, and discuss the obstacles that some people face when they're trying to get one. So. All right, uh, the previous deadline for the real ID was October 1st of 2020, which was last week. Um, because of COVID-19, that uh, deadline has been extended by a year, and the new deadline is October 1st of 2021. And by that date, uh, your South Carolina driver's license or the identification card that you get from the DMV uh, must have a gold star in the top right corner if you intend to use it in order to board a commercial airline flight, enter a secured federal building, or uh, enter a military base installation or a federal courthouse. Um, just a little caveat, if you're, if you are uh, a witness at a federal courthouse and you don't have a real ID, that will not prevent you from entering the courthouse to testify. And yeah, see any other bullets here? Any other screen? The Real ID was enacted under the uh, the United States Congress passed the Real ID Act in 2005. It was in response to to 9/11, uh, to, uh, um, and the federal government quickly realized after 9/11 happened that there were a number of things regarding the uh, access and the ability to obtain identification cards that allow you to to purchase plane tickets and, and board a plane. Uh, in our certain secured facilities that it was seriously compromised because of the lack of uniformity from state to state in terms of IDs and driver's licenses that were issued to people. 
<clears throat> the majority of the uh, hijackers had, uh, some of them had expired visas where they lawfully entered the country and the visas expired. Uh, some of them had two or three uh, driver's licenses and or IDs from different addresses uh, in different states. Um, some of them were actually flagged for affiliation with terrorist activity uh, or terrorist organizations, but because the information wasn't coordinated between the states uh, in terms of the issuance of IDs, uh, a lot of the red flags were missed. And so Congress realized that they needed to uh, try to come up with a way to make uh, identification cards, driver's licenses, uh, more difficult to um, to uh, counterfeit, basically. So it would be more difficult to make to get a fraudulent ID or a fraudulent driver's license. It was remarkably easy. There were some terrorists who had three or four driver's licenses or IDs from different countries. Uh, many of them had uh, expired passports. So the question became when Congress was investigating was well, how did with all these inconsistencies. How is it so easy to get these uh, these IDs and, and then board these planes and 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 create this disaster? So that was the purpose of the act. Um, let's see, sorry, I think I'm, my screens are switched here. So forgive me for looking back and forth. Um, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has deemed South Carolina to be fully compliant with the Real ID Act. South Carolina is currently issuing Real IDs. Um, as we speak, um, I, I just want to say this before I forget. If you don't have a real ID and you have a regular driver's license, that you're fine. If you're, if the deadline passes and you still have your regular driver's license, you, that's not an issue unless you need to board a, 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 a commercial airline or you need to enter a federal building or military base of some sort. Um, for example, a lot of uh, a lot of federal contractors. A lot of uh, civilian employees of the federal government needed real IDs in order to get uh, on and off uh, federal installations. So that's just an, uh, that's just uh, to let people know that if they don't have a, a real ID and they don't obtain it by the deadline, that doesn't prevent them from driving or, or any any other um, use of regular use of their driver's license. Uh, the difference you'll notice one difference. Uh, other than the gold star in the top right corner, um, you will notice that the, the real ID is issued for only eight years. Your current driver's license uh, now is issued for up to 10 years. Uh, so every eight years, you'll have to renew that real ID as opposed to a regular driver's license, which is renewed every 10 years. Uh, let's see. Uh, so far, about uh, probably about one fourth of the Americans who are eligible for a real ID have obtained it. So about about 95 uh, million of 275 million uh, people who are eligible to obtain one have obtained one. Some states are farther along uh, in their uh, issuance of real IDs. Um, one of the reasons for the lag time in some other states was that a lot of legislators in individual states and also a lot of citizens had uh, concerns about privacy uh, and they were concerned about turning all this personal information over to the federal government. Um, but the information that is obtained in order to issue your real ID is not held in some big federal database. It's held at your state DMV. Uh, your real ID, the strip, actually contains your personal information, but it is specific to you and it, it is not um, uploaded or made available to the federal government in general. It's, it's in the state database for your, your Department of Motor Vehicles. Sorry, let me get through those. I think I've covered those points. And once again, the purpose of the whole purpose of having a real ID is to make it more difficult to alter um, or to fraudulently duplicate. Ironically, that makes them a little bit more difficult to get than a regular driver's license. Some of the acceptable documents that uh, you can present in order to obtain uh, a real ID, but the very first one should be your birth certificate that was left off of the slide. That's my bad. Uh, your driver's license or your state issued ID card that you currently have issued by the DMV, your US passport 
for a passport card, a passport issued by a foreign country, the uh, Department of Homeland Security Trusted Travelers card. Uh, there is a link at the end of this presentation to the TSA website. Uh, the um, names listed there are some uh, specific types of uh, trusted traveler uh, cards that are issued. And if you go to the TSA website and, and complete the process to pre-screen, you can obtain one of those, uh, one of those cards if you qualify. Uh, U.S. Department of Defense ID cards, and that includes IDs issued to de uh, dependents of U.S. Department uh, employees. Permanent residence cards, border crossing cards, uh, HSPD 12 cards. That is a card that's issued to federal contractors so that they can get on and off of secured federal property. Uh, and then veterans ID cards, veterans health ID cards, those are issued to veterans veterans who need health services that are provided in medical facilities that are located on, for example, a military base or a mil military installation. So those documents can be, uh, or cards can be presented uh, when you're applying for your real ID. Now the documents that you prevent, present, they have to do several things. They have to prove your identity, they have to prove your date of birth, uh, obviously your age, um, they have to prove your current address. So PO boxes are probably not going to be sufficient. A lot of people have used PO boxes for their uh, personal bills, maybe their utilities, that sort of thing. Um, you can use a utility bill if it's if it's addressed to a particular a specific uh, street address. Your voter registration card is an example. Uh, your property tax bill is an example, and also your vehicle registration and a number of other documents. Uh, and these are documents that you would take to the DMV while you're trying to qualify for your real ID. Uh, you need to be able to prove your legal presence in the country. Um, undocumented persons are generally not eligible for the issuance of a real ID, but there are a couple of slides later. Uh, I'll show you um, some examples of documents that undocumented persons can present uh, to apply and qualify for a real ID. You need proof of your social security number, that obviously is your social security card, a W-2 form that has your employer's uh, information and your social security number on it, or even your completed tax returns, recent tax returns. Photocopies are not acceptable. So if, if, you, if you are presenting a document uh, that's issued by a state agency, for example, your birth certificate, a copy of your birth certificate is probably not gonna satisfy the DMV. You're gonna need to request a copy of your uh, a, a, a certified copy of your birth certificate. Um, let's see, uh, a court order, if you need a court order that shows a change of your name uh, after divorce, you probably are gonna need to check with the clerk of court for the county where you were divorced to obtain a, a certified true copy of that order because a photocopy may not be accepted by the DMV. There's some additional types of documents. Um, the, your passport obviously proves your identity and your age, um, also your birth certificate, your social security card, um, your W-2 form has your employer information, has your security, uh, social security number and your employer's name, et cetera, on it. So that'll be helpful for that purpose. Uh, you need two proofs in South Carolina of current physical address and that uh, if you use, for example, a utility bill, that utility bill cannot be uh, older than three months. So it has to be a bill that was issued in uh, uh, three months, the previous three months or earlier and with the same name and address. I should tell you with these documents, when you present them, if there are inconsistencies in the spelling of your name and the form of your name, and I'll talk to you a little bit later about people who chain who uh, sort of informally assume the use of a, a nickname uh, or even a maiden name those people are going to run into obstacles when they try to when they present these documents they're not going to try to figure out which one is the correct version of your name there are some instances where people have different birth dates on some documents like a voter id card and a driver's license may have a different birthday card uh, uh, birth date on it and if you don't if you haven't corrected for example that voter id card you probably should do that or not submit that document and a proof of all legal name changes. Uh, this doesn't sound like a big deal, for, but for uh, women in particular who've been married more than once, 
Um, you have to document every name change. Um, there are uh, just in general, just anecdotally, a lot of women who will, um, who may not obtain a name change in during their divorce. So it's not included in the divorce order, but they may informally go back to using a maiden name. And if they do that, and they start to fill out other official documents or even um, maybe uh, change their social security card, um, that the DMV is gonna ask you for that court order that shows that name change. So you gotta get the court order. It's gonna be a particular problem for people who were not born in South Carolina and who may have lived in multiple states um, or who may have been married or, or divorced in another state because they're gonna have to obtain those documents from the clerk of court in the state and the county where they were divorced. If they, um, they will also, if their name changed from their maiden name to their uh, married name, they may need a copy of their marriage license. In South Carolina, you would obtain that from the county probate court in the county where you were married. In other states, I think I've, I've seen um, orphans courts, it depends on the, the state. Pennsylvania is one I can think of where you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get your license from the a probate court, you would get it from the orphans court. So it just depends. Um, I, if you need a real ID or you anticipate that you'll need one, you've got approximately a year minus about four days. And this is the time to start to try to gather those documents. So you'll know way in advance if you're gonna run into obstacles uh, getting these documents. Once again, you have to have original documents. If you try to submit photocopies, the DMV will probably not accept them. They also won't accept scan documents. Does everyone need a real ID? No, only people who, who fly domestically uh, on commercial flights, who, who regularly enter or even one time have to enter a federal facility such as a military installation um, need a real ID. Minor children who are accompanied when they travel, uh, especially by air with an adult who has a real ID do not need one. Children, I think between the ages of, I believe five and 15, if they traveled unaccompanied by an adult, they probably do need a real ID. And uh, for adults, I think the cost is $25, but for children, I believe the cost is 15. You do not need a real ID to vote or to register to vote, um, to be licensed to drive or to rent a car, to apply for or receive federal benefits such as VA benefits or social security benefits, uh, you don't need one to enter a federal facility that does not require identification, such as a local social security office, national parks, or a US post office. And you don't need one to access uh, hospital services, health clinics, or emergency medical care. What might prevent a person from being able to get a real ID? Um, one of the most common is that they do not have a birth certificate. Uh, and I'm not talking about children, obviously, because uh, children under five, I'm speaking primarily of uh, older people who need a delayed birth certificate because they were delivered by a midwife or had some other circumstance where their birth certificate was not generated. There are a number of people who were born in hospitals, um, but for, for one reason or another, usually it's, it's specific to that person's uh, just individual circumstances, and some of them are pretty unusual. There was no birth certificate issued. Um, I think um, uh, some of you may have seen an article several months ago from our Greenwood office where we had a gentleman who was a high school, a retired high school principal whose first name on his birth certificate was his gender, I think, uh, because he was born prematurely and he wasn't expected to survive. His parents uh, forgot to adjust, to correct that. And when he began to thrive and obviously grew to be, you know, uh, a, a uh, just an adult with no issues, um, when he tried to get his social security benefits, he ran into two issues with his birth certificate. That's the second uh, bullet that you see there. They have an error on their birth certificate and where the birth certificate needs to be corrected. Um, they cannot document the changes uh, from marriages or divorces or court order name changes. Uh, those who use nicknames or informal name changes. Lawrence, he never likes his, his, his first name, so he changes his name to Larry, um, which is a nickname for, for a lot of people who, whose name is Lawrence. Abigail may change her name to Abby. And the problem becomes when you start filling out official documents, especially if you do it from a young age, and, and then you go in for a real ID and you present your 
your your birth certificate, if you hadn't been married or divorced, and they see Larry versus Lawrence on some of these official documents, then you've got a you've got a problem. Uh, also, being undocumented could cause you a problem. Uh, for the delayed birth certificate and for the um, errors or amendments that need to be corrected on your birth certificates, you would first try to resolve that issue administratively at the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control in their vital records division. They do have an administrative process. A lot of people run into issues when they try to do that because the documentation that they present to try to get their birth certificate is inconsistent. Um, sometimes the birth date is wrong. If they present uh, school records from year to year, there may be a different spelling of their name or a different date of birth or something of that nature. And, and typically, if that happens, they'll be turned away and told that they need a lawyer to get that corrected. Uh, in reference to undocumented persons, these are requirements for non-citizens. Um, if they can, if they if they have one of these uh, statuses other than being a U.S. citizen, um, if they are a U.S. lawful permanent resident or a lawful temporary resident, if they're a conditional permanent resident, uh, if they have conditional permanent residence status in the U.S., if they have an approved asylum application or have entered the country as a refugee and they are considered to be in refugee uh, status, if they have a valid unexpired non-immigrant visa. If they have a pending application for asylum, if they have a pending or approved temporary protected status, that typically refers to dreamers. Um, if they have uh, an approved deferred action status, or if they have a pending application for adjustment of status uh, to that of lawful permanent resident or conditional resident, those people, if they can prove that, if they can prove their status and they apply for a real ID, they'll likely be issued a real ID. As I said, hey, the cost for a real life, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, we are, we do have a question or two, and okay. I wanted to see if you wanted to go ahead and. Uh, we can take the questions. The uh, audience as well. Sure. Okay. Um, and I think you may have already covered this, but um, one question is how much of the documents are required? And um, I know. I think the slides probably answer that question. They do. Um, I have so many lists, maybe. Uh, there's a list of the forms. There's, they're varied on the DMV form. I think it's MV94. Uh, there are lots of documents that are listed. Um, for proof of your address, you need uh, two proofs of address. Um, only one proof of address is needed if you're getting a permit or something, but if you're getting a real ID, you need two proofs of, proof, two proofs of address uh, for your social security number. Basically, essentially to prove every element, your, your ID, your citizenship, your date of birth, you only need one document, generally speaking, except for the address, you need two. But there are some documents that serve more than one purpose. Um, so your current valid driver's license or your permit or um, your ID card will prove both your, uh, may prove, may confirm your birth date on your, on your uh, birth certificate, but it also may prove your, um, your address. Uh, so some of the documents can be used interchangeably to prove uh, different things, but you definitely need two separate uh, proofs of the address for a lot of uh, a lot of the families uh, that qualify for our services, we have a lot of families who are intergenerationally in the same household. So there can only be one utility bill, one light bill, one water bill. And so that can sometimes be a challenge for people. Um, and you probably need to be intentional about trying to establish uh, something, maybe a bank statement or something that comes to your physical address if the utility in particular, because those are are the go-to documents for the DMV. If the utility is in the name of another household member, you wanna be very intentional. You can also use uh, sometimes some of, the, um, uh, some of the information where you registered for school, including high school, college, FAFSA, um, anything like that that has, your, uh, that has your physical address on it. But if you go to the link at the end of this presentation at the DMV website and search for form MV94, That'll give you a comprehensive list. It's actually an international list. So, so it, it will suffice for both 
uh, U.S. citizens and international people who live in the country and who are trying to get a real ID. Uh, but the but the uh, documents are varied, and there's a lot of them. So you have a whole bunch of choices um, to try to assemble the documents that you need. Um, and if you you know if you present something and they tell you that it's not sufficient, you may be able to just you know sort of leave the documents or upload the documents or, or schedule an appointment with the DMV and provide them with what you have and then go about trying to get the documents that are missing. Uh, usually there's the uh, court orders, that sort of thing. Those are gonna take some time. Um, just going back to the issue of um, people who do uh, informal name changes. I had a young lady recently that I filed a case for in family court didn't have anybody to sue. It was just in the matter of she was uh, married and had hyphenated her last name. She had two small children. Her husband passed away. And after he passed away, she started informally using, she just dropped the, the portion of her husband's name and went back to using her maiden name. But she did not have a court order um, to indicate that she was legally allowed to do that. Um, when she went to the DMV to try to get a real ID, they would not give her one. And they told her she needed a court order. Obviously, she doesn't need to sue uh, DHEC because DHEC doesn't need to change her birth certificate because the name she's using is the name that's on her birth certificate, which is her first name, her middle name, and her maiden name. So we essentially had to file a case and get the family court judge to, after she complied with all of the elements of the name change statute, to sort of uh, jump through all those hoops and get the judge to issue an order. Now, that's a cumbersome process. So if, if there's anybody who is contemplating getting a divorce, and trying to determine whether or not they want to go back to their maiden name, that that divorce process is really the quickest and the sort of most direct way to do it. The uh, separate name change statute, um, especially if you're amending, as opposed to getting um, a delayed birth certificate, is a lot more burdensome. It requires a sled check. It requires a check of the DSS central registry. Uh, it requires that you get fingerprinted. Um, checks the sex offender registry um all sorts of things so it can take some time uh and then you have to have a hearing in most cases there are some family court judges who will issue those orders uh, without a hearing but that's not a large percentage because a lot of them want to eyeball the person who wants to change their name or who wants to do something to their birth certificate there are some judges who are not terribly familiar with the statute so they kind of give it a side eye and they need to uh, you know they'll they they they're favorably disposed, generally speaking, towards people who come in with those issues, but they do want to see that you check the boxes in the statute. So you don't want to have to file a separate uh, name change or correction action in order to get this real ID, especially if you have something coming up, maybe a wedding, a destination wedding for, for a family member that's out of the country. You don't fly often, but you know you need to fly for that purpose. And it's maybe a year or less away and you want to start now if you have an issue like that in order to try to resolve it before you actually need the ID. Um, you can start submitting, I'm sorry, Susie, was there another question? Um, there's not another question, but I can, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, obstacles that can come up unexpectedly. So you want to go ahead and see how many in our audience have actually attempted to get the real ID and have run into something like that. Okay. If everybody would just uh, answer the question, have you attempted to get your real ID, but were not able able to because of uh, some obstacle? It can be some of the ones that Sheila has mentioned or some other obstacle. We're just kind of looking for how many people have actually tried it and had an obstacle that kept them from getting it. Just answer yes or no. We'll leave that up for about 30 seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. So it looks like only 8% uh, have tried to get a real ID and weren't able to because of an obstacle. So hopefully um, your information, Sheila, is helping out with that and looks like a lot of people have not either haven't tried it or haven't had an obstacle. So. 
Okay. And you can actually start the process now trying to get your real ID. Oops. Uh, you can start submitting your documents now. I need to make that go away. Uh, we did have one other uh, question while we've paused, um, Sheila, uh -huh. and that is um, Susan says, I haven't tried to get the real ID. My driver's license is due uh, for renewal next year. I'm trying to be prepared to apply. So that was, uh, couldn't answer that poll question exactly, I guess. Okay, but well, if she wants to, she can um, go to the DMV website. The link is at the end of the presentation and, and search for that form MV-94. Look through it, it's in very tiny print, um, but take your time and look through it to see if you can check those boxes. And um, what she may wanna do is go ahead and start submitting her documents to the DMV, once she starts the submission process, they'll give her a customer number. So if she provides other documents in the process, um, she'll use that customer number as a reference number. And then once she submitted all of her documents, if they're acceptable to the DMV, uh, they'll issue uh, her real ID and, and most likely send it in the mail. If for some reason you have to go into the DMV to provide a document, they ask you to bring a certified document or an original document into a branch. Uh, first, not all the branches are accepting appointments. And second, you most likely will need an appointment. You can schedule an appointment online. If you go to the DMV uh, website, you'll see um, an indication of where you can do that if you need to go into the agency for some reason. You may very well have to go outside of your county uh, because there are some, some of the smaller counties where um, they don't take appointments, but you know, a nearby county that's somewhat larger, you can schedule your appointment there and you can take your documents in. Don't try to, you know, don't try to give them copies, even if the copy looks like a, a certified document with, with the printers, the advancement in, in uh, printing capabilities, there are some copies that can look like originals at first glance. Um, you know, you're just, you know, you're just, probably going to frustrate yourself and probably annoy them if you try to present them with a uh, with a copy. When you go to get court orders in particular, if you would ask the clerk of court for either a raised seal or a colored seal on your um, the copy of the document that you need, and when you do go to court, you need to present an ID. They're not just going to give it to anybody. Uh, if you indicate that you were divorced in that county, give them the date, give them the party's, the, uh, your spouse's name, they can typically uh, pull up a, a a copy of your um, divorce order and that what they're doing actually is making you a certified true copy from the original document that was signed by the judge that's in that remains in the court file um, so that document be sure if you actually have to go to the clerk's office to get it that you ask for a raised seal or a colored seal so the dmv can distinguish between a photocopy and a, and a, and an actual certified true copy This is a sample of South Carolina's Real ID. Uh, you'll notice the gold star up in the right-hand corner. Some states actually have a black star. Some states refer to the cards as star cards for obvious reasons. Um, but if you have an ID card or a driver's license and you pull it out and you don't see that gold star, that means you don't have a Real ID. And like I said, you don't necessarily need one, but if you wanna do those few things with regard to traveling by commercial, uh, commercial airline or if you anticipate at some point that you'll have to enter a federal facility, if you've got a, a young person in your family who has, um, who has got, for example, people at Fort uh, Jackson, uh, when they graduate, you want to go see them graduate. When we're able to resume in-person uh, attendance at graduation ceremonies, you may need a real ID to get on that base. So if you think that's going to happen, you might need to go ahead and start trying to try, trying to submit the documents so that you can get it uh, in advance. Uh, some of my recommendations are do not wait until the last minute. You'd be surprised how uh, long sometimes it could take uh, to uh, to accomplish this if there's a barrier uh, such as a, uh, a court order that you need. If you don't have a birth certificate and you need a delayed birth certificate, you need the agency to create one for you, it is rare that they can do that administratively because typically 
um, the documentation that you have to prevent, uh, present to vital records doesn't exist or is not satisfactory and has some inconsistencies in it. So you may need to uh, have an attorney file a, a case for you. Some people attempt it by themselves. A lot of people end up having to retain counsel. People who qualify can certainly apply for our services. And I think we have a link to the South Carolina uh, Bar Referral Service. Um, if you have never seen your long form birth certificate, because when I say birth certificate, I'm speaking of a long form, not the little card that we all carry around in our wallets. Those are useless in this process. Um, if you've never seen it and or you don't know where it is and you were born in South Carolina, you need to request it ASAP. If you go to the link for uh, the DHEC website, the vital records website and complete the uh, birth certificate application, uh, you fill in just very short um, the information, your information, your address, uh, the reason that you need it, you identify whether you're asking for it or there's a very short, a brief list of the people who can ask for it um, other than you. Um, and then there's uh, just some very basic information about your parents. Now, what sometimes happens, especially for people who've never seen it and they may be a, a say 50 year old or 60 year old, it's quite possible that there's something on that birth certificate that they don't expect like one of the parents' names might be different. It's unlikely that their mom's name is different, but um, there may be a, either a misspelling or a different person listed as their dad. If that's the case, the, the uh, vital records agency will not give you that birth certificate. Uh, and that's the point at which you probably need to call an attorney uh, because that just means, doesn't mean you've uh, you know, falsified anything. It just means you've never seen it. Most people never have, um, but you need it. If you get a letter from the agency that says we've searched, typically they do a search and they need your mother's name, full name, maiden name to do a search. They typically search 10 years before, 10 years after. So we catch almost a 20 year parameter within the date of your birth. And if they don't find a birth record, they'll send you what we call a not found letter. Save that letter because you need that letter to file um, a case in family court to get a delayed birth certificate. If you get a letter that says, we, just paraphrasing, we searched our records, we think we found your birth record, but it doesn't comport with the information that you gave us. Um, and sometimes they'll tell you to come in and bring certain documents. Sometimes they'll tell you you need a court order. Um, but more recently, I think they've tried to sort of make their administrative process a little easier to navigate. But for a lot of people, it just is still very difficult. So if you get a letter like that, um, you want to um, contact the agency, see if there's anything additional that you can bring in that'll clear up any sort of confusion or ambiguity. And if they straight up tell you that you need a lawyer, they're just telling you we're not going to issue what you need without a court order. So you know what to do then. Um, at some point, and I think in the middle of the pandemic, probably about two months into, maybe a month and a half into uh, the shutdown, Vital Records closed their physical office and they were taking people only by appointment. So if, as predicted, there's an upsurge in the, uh, in the um, infection rate and, and state agencies start to close again and take people by appointment, you need to be prepared for that and expect that. If you do have to go to Vital Records, you need to have a valid ID. So you can't walk in there without an ID and ask for a copy of your birth certificate. They need to see a current valid ID or else they're not going to give it to you. If you don't have one or yours has expired because you've been trying to do this for years um, and you pull up that application for a birth certificate, uh, there are, like I said, a short list of people who can request it for you, a child, an adult child, I, you know, you may want to ask um, or you may want to, if you qualify for legal services, just to see if we can assist you in getting a copy of your birth certificate. It may be that you don't need a change, but there's something about uh, well, even just the lack of an ID, a valid ID can keep you from getting it. Uh, so, so start the process of trying to get it early. Don't wait because, you know, the longer you wait, um, the longer you could be on the other end of uh, past that deadline or past your personal deadline um, to do something that you need to do with that real ID that you can't get done until you get it. Uh, because you have some other obstacle to try to get around that's going to take some time, like a, like a court action. Some of those go fairly quickly, but some of them can drag out for different reasons. Um, and we've got a couple more questions if you. Sorry, sure, go ahead. 
Um, I think this, I, I can make an educated guess on the answer to this, but let's uh, see, what is the heart on the real ID for? I think it's uh, organ donation, I believe. That's what I figured. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I think that's on, I'd have to check then, on that. Yeah, um, and then a related question uh, is, um, do I have to provide these documents each time I renew my real ID? Usually, no, um, especially if it hasn't expired. So if you renew it before the expiration date, like with a regular driver's license, if you let your driver's license expire, and at the time you got your original driver's license, you, prevented, you, you presented your um, a certified copy of your birth certificate, and you have no idea where it is 10 years later, you may very well have to uh, supply your driver's license again. I mean, I'm sorry, your birth certificate again, in order to get a new driver's license if it has expired. If if the um, ID card has or the real ID has not expired, it's very unlikely that you'd have to provide any of those documents again, unless of course within that eight year span you marry and divorce again, and then you probably at least have to provide those documents that can explain that change of name. Um, you know, if you change your your Social Security card and your you know all other um, documents because you married or divorced. So if your name has changed since the last time you had the real ID issued, you likely either have to start the process again, or you'll have to provide the documents that will explain the name change between the first issuance of the real ID and the renewal of the real ID. Great. That's all the questions for now. Okay. If you um, if you think you're uh, there's also a um, there is a brochure for the real ID on the DMV website. Um, so again, if you go to the link, uh, click on the link, and then when you, in the search bar, if you put in a uh, real ID brochure, the brochure will pop up. It's two pages long. It has some condensed information that's very helpful. Um, so for people who think they want to take a look at that, they can go to the link and, uh, and pull up the brochure. It's very colorful, eye-catching, uh, and the information is very straightforward. Um, if you do not qualify for legal services and you have some sort of a legal barrier that you need to, to get over in order to get your real ID, you can call the South Carolina Lawyer Referral Service and the number is on the presentation. And just uh, as an aside, there's some alternatives to the real ID. So if you show up and you don't have a real ID, but you have a U.S. passport or a passport card, you're not going to have a, a problem most likely getting onto a plane. If you have a military identification card, or a trusted traveler's ID card, like a global entry card, you're not going to have a problem. Um, the numbers on this slide are if you, there's a number for South Carolina Legal Services, Lawyer Referral Services, um, the contact information for the DMV, DHEC, and our office in Orangeburg. And that is my presentation. And I thank you all for coming. I would refer you to our um, social media. Uh, our YouTube, I think we have some other level up um, presentations that are of interest for the people who have issues with their birth certificates. I believe maybe a month or two ago, we had a presentation on that. And so there's probably a YouTube recording of that. So you may want to look at that to get some more details and it might be helpful to you in trying to resolve that issue. Well, and Sheila, then... I want to thank you so much for an excellent presentation uh, on being prepared for getting the real ID. And let me also thank all of you who joined us today. We definitely appreciate your interest in this subject matter and others, as Sheila mentioned. Um, Level Up Law is a series of free legal events to educate the public on some of the most commonly faced legal challenges that we see here at Legal Services. You can join us every Tuesday at noon to learn the basics of a particular topic. And as Sheila mentioned, we have all of the Level Up Law um, episodes on our YouTube channel, and this one will be uh, posted there uh, later this week. So just go to our YouTube channel at South Carolina, or at, actually I think it's at SC Legal Services, and uh, click on the playlist for Level Up Law. Be sure to like and subscribe and uh, sign up for those notifications, and that way you'll know every time we've posted a new one. Now, uh, if you have an issue and you need legal assistance and can't afford a lawyer, you can see here on your screen um, all the information that you need to contact South Carolina Legal Services. 
you can call, but you can also apply online for our services, which is a great feature. Um, we do have uh, intake uh, specialists standing by Monday through Thursday, nine to six, so be sure and call in or do the online application. Uh, you can also um, find on our website that is shown here, lawhelp.org slash SC and also sclegal.org, um, uh, quite a number of other legal resources that are available to you. Um, not just our Level Up Law episodes, but all kinds of other great legal information. Um, there's re resources like checklists and articles. Uh, we have a wonderful um, set of brochures, quite a number of those on very specific legal topics. And we even have online classrooms on subjects like unemployment benefit appeals, guardianship, debt collection, getting your landlord to make repairs, filing for an order of protection, all kinds of things. So please do check those out. Um, and I think you'll there's find that there's something uh, for everybody. Now, uh, again, thank you for tuning in. And we do hope that you'll tune in next Tuesday when we will be answering the most frequently asked questions about divorce in South Carolina. So that will be very interesting and an easy way to see what's coming up each week after today is to check out our Legal Services Facebook page. We can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Again, be sure to like and subscribe so you can see what's coming up and see all the other information that we post on social media on this and other subjects. So that concludes today's webinar. We look forward to having you back with us next week. And again, Sheila Thomas, Managing Attorney of our Orangeburg office, thank you so much for joining us today and provide such an excellent presentation. No problem.